So one thing I wanted to say at the beginning of this part of the lecture is to just emphasize the importance of history, but also how far back you can go in order to get meaningful examples. You will be surprised, I think, just how far back you can go to biblical times even in order to get useful economic insights. So focus on this classical book here by Reinhardt and Rogoff, 2009. A historical perspective variously highlights the importance of currency debasement, asset price bubbles, financial sector crises. So what you have here is a certain amount of failure of imagination, usually linked in some way to the unforeseen circumstances of a deterioration in asset quality coupled with excessive speculation. So the classic example of this would be the 2008 crisis and too much speculation in the US housing market. And this fourth item here is what Reinhardt and Rogoff term this time is different syndrome. So usually what you would expect to find here is that, okay, yes, this time is a little bit different, but not so different in order to preclude various lessons that you might be able to learn from the historical experience. Okay, now one thing I ought to say here is that arguably this book by Reinhardt and Rogoff understates the importance of asset price bubbles. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to go through here is signorage. So if you're asked to define what a national currency is, it's perhaps a little bit lowbrow to say this, but you could view this at least in part as being just the tokens that you pay your national taxes in. So with this sort of loose definition in mind, signorage is the profit made by a government by issuing currency, especially the difference between the face value of coins and their production costs. Okay, and it might sound a little bit far out, but this serves as an important key motivation behind the origination of Bitcoin. So the motivation behind Bitcoin was at least in part that national currencies had been viewed by some as being unfairly and progressively devalued. So if you look at the deterioration in the value of the dollar or pound sterling over time, for example, now, I think this does mean that the subject is inherently controversial and indeed inherently speculative precisely when you try and think about making a separation between money and the nation state. OK, but the idea here is that there are potential deficiencies with this model of currencies being completely controlled by nation states and to a certain extent Bitcoin is a reaction against that. OK, so currency debasement is an important historical problem. So the comment is made in Reinhardt and Rogoff that inflation became a commonplace chronic problem amongst national currencies only when you had widespread use of paper currency. Historically, government found ways of extracting seniorage from the currency in circulation many centuries before this. So the main way of doing this was to debase the precious metal content of coins. So you can variously mix in cheaper metals, clip coins, or shave down coins and reissue smaller coins in the same denomination. So the comment is made by Reinhardt and Rogoff that modern currency presses are just a technologically more advanced and more efficient way of achieving the same goal. <coughs> okay, you can do exactly the same as governments have done historically, but you don't have to get your hands dirty and you don't run the risk of cutting your fingers off. OK, I also want to say here that currency debasement is a deceptively big issue and there were elements of European wars where foreign governments tried to flood other countries with fake currency in order to achieve this currency debasement. OK, so this is potentially a bigger deal than you might first imagine. OK, so currency debasement is important. So the first easy thing to say here is this provides a motivating example behind the origination of Bitcoin. Also, it emphasises, I think, the importance of taking a historical perspective. So moving to a new technology, e.g. from metallic to paper currencies to make transporting currencies easier, still led to repetition to the same form of financial crisis. 
and indeed going from currencies backed by precious metals to just the current day fiat currencies still you have the same problem occurring okay so this time is different a bit but again not as different as you might have wished unfortunately there's also important because this is sort of rather ominous warning in Reinhardt and Rogoff they draw an analogy with new technology and warfare the statement there is that new moving to new technologies didn't eradicate warfare it only made it more deadly so there is a sort of concern that you might get a similar effect with respect to future financial crises okay moving to new technologies didn't eradicate these crises potentially makes it just more deadly with everything being more interlinked okay certainly this is potentially a big deal so again with a view to my low-minded economic discussion from earlier think of national currencies as tokens that citizens just use to pay their national taxes so if you reduce the value of a currency by debasing it however you achieve that the idea is that it becomes cheaper and easier for the national governments to pay their debts everyone else loses out as prices increase as the money supply chasing the same fundamental value increases this is serious if your wages don't increase at the same time that prices increase okay even if your wages do increase nominally this could still be serious and bad news and in extreme cases you might get something called hyperinflation which is seen in recent years in Zimbabwe and historically in Weimar Germany prior to the outbreak of the Second World War and just to restate that currency debasement is a big deal so inflation caused by increasing the money supply via the introduction of counterfeit coinage was a key aspect of Central European warfare in the 1500s okay so this is almost something that was used as an instrument of war in the relatively recent history in Europe so currency debasement serious serious issue so historical examples of currency debasement are important obviously history is important hopefully we can all agree on that beyond that it's surprising just how far back you can go to find relevant economic examples to biblical times for instance so the idea of debasement is not new and dates back to at least Dionysius of Syracuse of Greece in the fourth century BC and the reference there is to Reinhardt and Rogoff classic examples of this are in England in 1542 with Henry VIII and continuing to the reign of his successor Edward VI and historical episodes of currency debasement across 12 modern European countries from the 13th to the 19th centuries are tabulated in Reinhardt and Rogoff so this has happened uh, throughout time and I think the surprising thing is just how deep-seated this is in our historical experience okay alongside that interestingly currency debasement across what is now Italy and Germany predates the foundation of these natural state nation states by several centuries okay so it's surprising just how deep-seated this issue of currency debasement is and how far back in time it goes okay it predates the foundation of modern European states for instance Now, one thing to say here is that speculative bubbles are important. I would say this, I'm an expert in speculative bubbles. One thing that's a little surprising is that this book by Reinhardt and Rogoff arguably understates the importance of speculative bubbles. While this is a potential weakness, they do highlight the importance of unintended consequences and a certain failure of the collective imagination, e.g. if the financial sector is exposed to excessive speculation okay so there are additional links to what Reinhardt and Rogoff term this time is different syndrome so bubbles and speculation is inevitable in some form or other look for new technological innovation and or an influx of new investors is one of the sort of two classic ingredients of speculative bubbles there's also drawn on the historical experience this potentially brutal competition 
that sorts out truly profitable from merely illusory opportunities. Okay, so it's quite easy, I think, to sort of imagine how this might occur here if you've got competition between different cryptocurrencies or new fintech startups battling to survive. And the thing I ought to sort of say here is that the serious bit here would be if the financial sector is overexposed to excessive speculation to either cryptocurrencies or other blockchain technology. So banking crises often occur as an unintended consequence of speculative bubbles. And this is discussed at length in Reinhardt and Rogoff. So historically, banking sectors have been exposed to crises that arise from what's termed here a protracted deterioration in asset quality. So the layman version of the story is that banks may have too much cash to invest in the latest speculative bubble. And this might be a problem that's facilitated by, say, cryptocurrencies or speculation in other blockchain assets. So the idea then is that the health of the whole sector can then be compromised once the bubble bursts. And there would be a concern here that this pattern could be repeated with respect to excessive speculation on either Bitcoin or blockchain, even if the bubbles in these assets aren't necessarily a problem in and of their own right. Okay, I also want to say here, I think what is important is not just this historical comparison, but a certain failure of the collective imagination and the way in which banks can sort of blindly invest in the latest speculative bubble and then leave themselves vulnerable as an entire sector. During on the historical experience then there's a particular danger highlighted in Reinhardt and Rogoff of these banking crises with the idea that the health of the entire financial sector could be compromised in unforeseen ways if they invest wholesale in the latest speculative bubble and it's possible that the latest speculative bubble could be facilitated by say Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies or other developments in blockchain technology. So again going back to the historical experience, it's important to remember and to recognise that historically this pattern has occurred irrespective of the genuine innovation that accompanied such episodes and indeed in developments where the potential benefits were arguably much more tangible than is currently the case for Bitcoin and blockchain. So examples of this would be the development of new colonies during the South Sea bubble, the railroad stocks bubble, railroads obviously useful asset in and of themselves. New technology stocks bubble in the turn of the millennium. Obvious clear parallels here with recent cryptocurrency bubbles and efforts to increase house ownership during the end of the first decade of the century that caused the US subprime crisis. Okay, clear historical precedence here to be concerned about. So the great financial crisis then serves as a useful contemporary tale of woe. So in Reinhardt and Rogoff, attention is brought to the burst of the IT bubble in 2001. So the idea is that this time is a little bit different, not as different as you would like it to be. So in this case, price earnings ratios far exceeded any historical norms due to excessive hype about the IT industry. There are there is at this point inevitable comparisons to be made between this historical bubble and Bitcoin and blockchain. And I'm sad to say an inevitable potential separation between technological innovation and commercial success. Following the collapse of the IT bubble, funds transferred to a subprime mortgage sector based on part on an assumption that prices would continue to rise. However, a lot of wishful thinking this time is perhaps a bit different, not as different as you would like it to be. The clear historical experience is that house prices are volatile. The other thing to sort of watch for here is a suggestion in Reinhardt and Rogoff of an unsustainable growth in the number of US financial firms. And this may also pose difficult questions for any era and also for current 
fintech innovators.